Thank, thank you all for coming. We'll go ahead and get started so we can get right into it. Um, I just want to say thank you to uh, the WNL Diversity Week Steering Committee, um, who did, had a lot of help putting this together. Um, first, and you know, and first of all, to the, our panelists and to our moderator for participating in what should be an excellent event. Um, I'd also like to thank the Federal Society, the American Constitution Society, and uh, the Contact Committee for sponsoring this. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Massey. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you for coming today. Uh, on, uh, as part of our continuing celebration of Diversity Week here at WNL Law School, today is a day of jubilation, a truly historic day in the life of our country. Uh, whatever your political views, however you actually voted in the last election, I think you have to agree that Martin Luther King's dream of a day when his children might be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin is that much closer uh, to being a reality with the election of the first American president of African heritage and even African name. Although there were undoubtedly those who uh, voted for President Barack Obama because of his color, and undoubtedly there were those who voted against him for that same reason. The fact is that through hard-fought primaries and a hotly contested election, an African-American man was, in the end, chosen by a substantial majority in this country as the best qualified person to lead us in these troubled and difficult times. That very fact represents a giant step forward from the days of the Civil Rights Movement and Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. And I think we can all take pride in that. The achievement represented by today's inauguration would not have been possible, as President Obama frequently acknowledges, without the major role played by law. First, there was the historic Supreme Court decision in 1954 of Brown versus Board, requiring that desegregated schools of state-run uh, segregated schools uh, must follow and in the years that followed that decision, as we know, federal courts struggled mightily to carve out remedies uh, for state-sponsored segregated schools and to make them uh, desegregated. The Civil Rights Movement made clear that court decisions were not enough, however. And the Great Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 continued Congress's push for equality. Not only African Americans benefited from the Civil Rights Act of 1964, particularly its Title VII, uh, which discriminated uh, against uh, or which violated discrimination in employment. Women, too, for the first time, were placed on an even playing field with men, officially at least. In the field of education, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited discrimination on the grounds of race, color, or national origin by any program receiving federal financial assistance. And later, Title IX of the Educational Amendments Act of 1972 provided the same with respect to gender, except for schools that historically and from their inception had been single sex. The court said the Equal Protection Clause vitiated that exception for state schools. All of us here are aware of the resulting impact on our neighbors at VMI, especially we who were here uh, before that decision. One kind of program, or sometimes even court remedy, that has been developed in this 50-year period of progress towards equality for all uh, has remained controversial. And that, as you know, is the topic for today's discussion, affirmative action. Specifically, with respect to higher education, colleges and universities began, at least by the 1970s, to seek to diversify their student bodies along grounds of race and ethnicity. This phenomenon was frequently referred to, particularly by its opponents, as reverse discrimination. Generally, white males who did not obtain admission to state-run schools of their choice 
but who were academically as qualified as, maybe even uh, better qualified than successful minority candidates, began to sue on grounds of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. The case that finally reached the Supreme Court was Regents of the University of California versus Bakke, an opinion authored by our own Justice Lewis Powell in 1978. In that case, the medical school of the University of California at Davis set aside a certain number of places in the entering class for minorities considered to be, quote, economically and or educationally deprived. The groups invited so to characterize themselves were blacks, Chicanos, Asians, and Native Americans. A separate committee applying more lenient standards decided which applicants from that group to admit to the 16 places reserved for them, 16 out of 100. In a complicated decision of shifting alliances on the court that I'm not going to get into today, uh, Justice Powell's opinion held that quotas, like the one at uh, Cal Davis Medical School, quotas themselves were not permissible. They violated both the Equal Protection Clause and Title VI. But state colleges and universities may take race into account in molding their entering class. Institutions of higher education, said Justice Powell, had a First Amendment right in academic freedom which, among other things, permitted them to select the members of their student body in a manner that would achieve diversity in that student body on the theory that such diversity would create a richer educational experience for all the students at the school. By diversity, Powell meant not only race and gender, but also such factors as geographical location, life experience, special talents, a history of overcoming obstacles, and other factors that the school might consider important. Because of the splintered nature of Powell's opinion, by the 1990s, some federal appeals courts began to rule that Bakke was of dubious precedential value, or even that it was no longer good law. The whole issue was revisited in 2003 in companion cases coming from the University of Michigan. Gratz versus Bollinger and Gretter versus Bollinger. The Gratz case, which came from Michigan's Undergraduate College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, once again struck down a program based on a separate selection process for minorities, which awarded 20 out of 150 possible admissions points for minority status. In Gretter, however, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, writing for the court in a five to four opinion, held that Bakke was still good law and that race could be taken into account as a plus factor in the University of Michigan's law school's admissions process. Furthermore, the law school was entitled in its admissions policies to pursue the goal of a critical mass of minorities so that members of those groups would not feel intimidated in the classroom and so that their white peers would learn that members of minority groups did not all speak with one voice accorded to them by stereotypes, but rather that they were, in fact, individuals harboring a wide variety of opinions. The Supreme Court's most recent foray into affirmative action waters in education uh, has been in the area of public school education, uh, grades K through 12, not higher education. That came in 2007 in a case called Parents Involved in Community Schools versus Seattle School District Number 1. There, the court held that a public school system was not permitted to pursue a goal of racial diversity in the student bodies of its various schools by using race as a tiebreaker to determine where a pupil was assigned once students had been assigned as nearly as possible according to their chosen preferences. In a system where there was no and had been no intentional segregation by race, said the court, there was likewise no problem that needed fixing by reallocating student attendance patterns. And the school system's attempt to reach some kind of racial balancing in its various schools was in itself a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Today, the Federalist Society and the American Constitutional Society between them 
have assembled for us a panel of people with differing views on the value and, I guess, even the validity of affirmative action programs in higher education. We have with us Professor Gail Harriet, a professor of law at the University of San Diego, whose expertise is in civil rights, employment law, products liability, remedies, and torts. Professor Harriet also writes for various popular newspapers and magazines from time to time, such as the Wall Street Journal and the National Review. She's a former civil rights counsel to the U.S. Senate on the judiciary. She is a graduate of Northwestern University and the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, Roger Clegg is president and general counsel of the Center for Equal Opportunity, located in Falls Church, Virginia. He focuses on legal issues arising from the civil rights laws, including the regulatory impact on businesses and affirmative action programs in higher education. Mr. Clegg is a former Deputy Assistant Attorney General in both the Reagan and Bush administrations. He held the second highest positions in first the Civil Rights Division from 1987 to 91 and the Environmental and Natural Resources Division from 91 to 93. He's a graduate of Yale Law School and I assume that didn't come full-blown like Athena from the head of Zeus before that you attended. Rice University. Washington University. Rice. Rice, Uni Rice University, okay. Our own Professor Ted Delaney is an Associate Professor of History at Washington and Lee. Professor Delaney is presently writing the story of school desegregation in four Virginia counties. The 50th anniversary of Brown in 2004 sparked an oral history project on his part in which he, working with student assistants, uh, interviewed former public school students, teachers, and administrators. He's now concentrating on examining manuscripts, newspapers, school board minutes, and the various governor's papers produced during that time period. Professor Delaney, who grew up in Lexington, uh, actually worked for the university prior to attending WNL as a student. He is a graduate of Washington and Lee University and holds a PhD in history from the College of William and Mary. So if you would welcome our guests, we'll let them have their say and then take questions, comments from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Massey, for a very nice uh, introduction and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, summary of the, of the case law. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I very much appreciate the the invitation from the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society. I appreciate uh, my uh, other panelists' uh, willingness to, to come today as well. Uh, I think it's actually turned out to be a terrific day uh, to, to have this discussion. Um, I have to say at first, when I got the invitation, I thought, gosh, uh, you know, I, I would hate for the students to have to choose between listening to me and, and watching the historic event that we all, I think, uh, probably watched uh, a couple of hours ago on TV, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad this was scheduled so that you were able to, uh, to have your cake and eat it too. Um, this is a, uh, as I say, a, a very good topic to discuss today because of the, uh, of the dramatic uh, events of, of, of a couple of hours ago. And you know, 10 minutes is um, not a lot of time to, to do justice to the topic of, of affirmative action, uh, you know, under, under any circumstances. And what I would like to do in, in, in the time that I have is, is really just provide a, a framework for you all to, to think about the issue. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to persuade anybody uh, you know, to make any conversions in, in, in 10 minutes, but I, I do think that um, uh, it's important to, uh, to, to think about this issue in, in, in a clear way and, and to be clear also about what we're talking about and, and, and what we're not talking about. The, the phrase affirmative action is an ambiguous one and its meaning has, has changed over time. It means different things to different people. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm going to start by you know, by, by, deferring, by defining that term with, with a little bit of care. Um, when the term was first used by President Kennedy in 1961, it, it really meant uh, taking positive steps, uh, proactive measures, just what it sounds like. Affirmative action 
to make sure that you weren't engaging in discrimination. And that kind of affirmative action is not controversial. It uh, doesn't raise any legal issues uh, these days. Um, uh, I have no problem with that kind of affirmative action. I, 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 fully, uh, I fully support it. Uh, another early meaning of the, of the term affirmative action was, uh, you know, what was called casting a wide net. You know, if you had a, a school or an employer uh, who for years had uh, refused to, to uh, accept African Americans, for instance. Um, you know, the idea was it wasn't enough just to, um, uh, uh, you know, quietly announce that you, or, you know, internally that you weren't going to be doing that anymore. You would have to change your, your recruiting patterns as well. You know, you wouldn't just send your recruiters to inner city highs or to, uh, uh, to suburban high schools. You'd, you know, send, send them to uh, inner city high schools as well and to historically black, black colleges and so forth. You know, really make it clear that everyone was welcome to apply. Uh, again, that kind of affirmative action is, 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 is not problematic as a, as a legal or a policy matter these days. The, the only kind of affirmative action that, that is controversial and that we're talking about today is uh, what Nathan Glazer called affirmative discrimination. That is, where you are taking race or ethnicity or sex into account in deciding uh, whether you're going to hire a person or whether you're going to accept somebody to a school or not. And we can uh, uh, discuss whether that's a good idea or not, but we have to be honest that we are talking about discrimination. We are, we are talking about treating people differently uh, on account of skin color or what country their ancestors came, came from or, um, or what, what, what sex they are. And that means, I think, that we have to uh, weigh very carefully not only the potential benefits that that kind of discrimination might have uh, and how plausible it is that there are benefits, but also the costs of that kind of discrimination as well. Um, too often, I think, the, the, the debates on this topic focus just on whether there are any possible benefits or not, whether there are educational benefits from diversity, whether there is still a, a valid remedial argument that can be made for discrimination. Uh, I don't think very much of those arguments. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that the benefits are very great. But even at the end of the day, if you say, well, you know, that, that Mr. Clegg, he's a very, you know, clever and, and good-looking guy, but I don't buy it. I think that there are some uh, benefits to, some educational benefits to diversity. Uh, you can't end your analysis there. You have to go on and say, well, all right, those are the possible benefits, but what about the possible costs? So, you know, that's the basic, you know, framework that I, that I want to, that I want to set out. Um, it's important also that we, we recognize that uh, the amount of discrimination that we're talking about is not typically trivial. Uh, race is not used, you know, just as a, as, as a tiebreaker. Um, uh, Professor Massey in her introduction said that, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, the, the white males who are turned down um, uh, are as qualified or maybe even better qualified than others who are admitted. Well, um, uh, you know, I would take issue with that in, in, in a couple of ways. First of all, uh, you know, it's not just white males that are being discriminated against these days. In fact, um, uh, women are discriminated against as much as men uh, in college admissions um, uh, if, if they're the wrong color. Uh, and it's also not, not just uh, whites who are discriminated against. Uh, frequently, uh, Asians are more discriminated against these days than, than are whites, and in many cases, Latinos as well. And sometimes it makes a difference from what kind of Latino you are. Uh, you know, Cubans are treated differently from Puerto Ricans and, you know, other nonsensical things like that. So, um, you know, I take issue with that. I also take issue with the, the, the suggestion that, well, you know, the, 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 these are all, um, you know, close questions. Uh, a lot of the times it's not a close question. One of the things that, that my organization does is use freedom of information laws to get um, uh, admissions data from schools, and then we, we do a regression analysis to see just how heavily 
race and ethnicity is being used. And I assure you that it is not being used simply as a tiebreaker. Um, just to give you, um, you know, uh, a couple of numbers, the most recent school that we looked at was the University of Nebraska Law School this year. And we found that if you uh, uh, had the uh, LSAT score and undergraduate grade point average and all the other sort of objective criteria uh, of, a, uh, of the median uh, African-American student who was admitted, uh, well, you know, if you, if you were African-American you had a, uh, and, and you had those, those, those qualifications, you had a 93% chance of getting in. If you were uh, white, you had a 3% chance of getting in. So, you know, it's, it's a substantial amount of, of weight that's being given to, to race in these, in these cases. Um, the, the arguments that are, that are put forward, that, you know, the possible benefits that, that, that are put forward are, are, are basically a, a two. Uh, there's the diversity rationale uh, that um, Professor Massey talked about that, that was uh, adopted by the Supreme Court. Uh, we can talk about that, uh, you know, in, in more detail maybe, you know, later on. Um, you know, my own view is that that really uh, relies on, on a supposition that you can tell somebody's experiences and outlooks by looking at their skin color. Uh, in, in other words, it relies on, on, on stereotyping. Um, uh, it also suggests that there is no better way to uh, to find out what uh, somebody's viewpoints and experiences are than looking uh, at their skin color. I don't, I don't buy, buy that either. My experience is that nobody really believes this. Um, uh, very soon in the course of any debate about uh, affirmative action, no matter how sophisticated the, uh, uh, the debaters, we're, we're soon talking about uh, historical discrimination. And the, the visceral sense that many Americans have that uh, given America's long, sad history of, of racial discrimination, we have to do something to make up for it. Uh, we have to do something to make it right. Um, the problem with, with, with that argument uh, is that, first of all, legally it's a non-starter. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court has rejected it. Um, secondly, you know, we're talking a bit now about giving preferences not to um, slaves or former slaves or people who are even alive during the Jim Crow era, but in the college admissions context, we're talking about giving preferences to people who were born in 1990. Um, now, that's not to say that people born in 1990 don't face racial discrimination or, or the, the effects of racial uh, discrimination, but I do think that, you know, given the, the enormous progress that's, that's been made, it doesn't make sense to uh, use skin color as a, as a proxy for disadvantage anymore. Uh, yes, it's true, the playing field is not even, but there are people of all colors at both ends of the playing field. Um, so uh, if we're going to give preferences uh, on the basis of disadvantage, that would be on the, pre on, the, on the basis of disadvantage rather than using skin color as a proxy for disadvantage. As President Obama himself uh, said in an interview, he doesn't think his own daughters uh, you know, given the, the privileged background that they've grown up in, uh, you know, would deserve a president, uh, would, would deserve a preference. And, and conversely, uh, he thinks that it would be uh, appropriate to give some special consideration to uh, Caucasians who uh, grew up in disadvantaged backgrounds. Well, anyway, uh, even if you think, though, that there is something to the, um, the, the, the benefits that are put forward these days for uh, the use of racial preferences. You can't end your analysis there. As I say, you have to go on and, and ask about the costs. And uh, I think I'm already over time, so I'm just going to very quickly list, uh, you know, the costs that I'm, that I'm aware of here. Uh, it's unfair. You know, you're, you're, you're treating people differently because of their, of their skin color. Um, you're setting a bad precedent. Um, you know, everybody always thinks they have a good reason for racial discrimination, and if you uh, allow it in, in one context, you're, you're opening the door to it in other contexts. Uh, you stigmatize the people that uh, you're supposedly helping. Um, you create resentment. Uh, you foster a victim mindset. You remove incentives for academic excellence. You encourage separatism. Uh, you compromise the academic mission of the university. 
Uh, you create inevitable pressure to lower grading and graduation standards. Uh, you, you foster hypocrisy uh, and a uh, uh, sort of a scoff law attitude toward, toward the law. Uh, you uh, set up many of the supposed beneficiaries of, of preferences for failure. Uh, through, through mismatching individuals and institutions, which I think Professor Harriet's going to talk about in more detail. You paper over the real problems uh, for why we still have racial disparities in, in so many uh, social contexts. Uh, you get into the ugly business of deciding which minorities you're going to discriminate in favor of and which ones you're going to discriminate against, uh, whether you're going to, you know, are you going to use a one drop rule or something like that. Um, you know, in the final analysis, I, I, I think it's very hard for any fair-minded person to, to think that a society that, uh, that is as increasingly multi-ethnic and multi-racial as the United States, and where individual Americans, like our president, uh, are increasingly multi-ethnic and, and multi-racial, we can have a legal regime that sorts people according to race and ethnicity and decides uh, who's going to be treated better and who's going to be treated worse on that, on that basis. Thank you all very much. I have no doubt that those who originally conceived of race-based admissions policies nearly 40 years ago um, I have no doubt they were acting in good faith. By lowering admission standards for African American and Hispanic students at selective law students, they were hoping to increase the number of minority students on campus and ultimately uh, to promote minority integration uh, into both the legal profession and society at large. And in fact, they had many success stories. Uh, at the same time, however, I have no doubt of the good faith of those who opposed those policies right from the beginning as a matter of principle. The real conflict over race-based admissions uh, hasn't been about good or bad, bad faith. Um, it's been about how we achieve our goals. We're all looking uh, to aspire to a society in which members of racial minorities are fully integrated into the, to the mainstream. Uh, there's no question that should be our goal. The conflict is about whether racial discrimination, something that nearly all Americans abhor, is an appropriate vehicle to achieve that end. Put starkly, should the principle of non-discrimination be temporarily sacrificed in the hope that such a sacrifice will, in the long run, help us to become the society of equal opportunity that we all aspire to? Justice Stanley Mosk of the California Supreme Court, um, a liberal's liberal. In fact, conservative California voters once tried to have him recalled on the basis of, of his liberal beliefs. Uh, they were successful in recalling some of the other justices of that court, but not Mosk himself. Uh, but he warned of the risks associated with such temporary compromises with principle over 30 years ago, when writing for the majority of the California Supreme Court in the Baki case, he held racially discriminatory admissions policies to be unconstitutional. I'm quoting him here. He said, to uphold the university would call for the sacrifice of principle for the sake of dubious expediency and would represent a retreat in the struggle to assure that each man and woman shall be judged on the basis of individual merit alone, a struggle which has only lately achieved success in removing legal barriers to racial equality. He was writing this in 1976. Mosk would laugh to hear someone call his views conservative since he was far more frequently accused of the opposite tendency. Uh, but whatever his political persuasion, Mosk had been a staunch ally of the civil rights movement right from the beginning, far from seeing a contradiction between his support for the civil rights movement and his opposition to minority-friendly race-based admissions policies in Baki. He viewed them as one and the same. His opposition to race discrimination was a matter of principle, and he was unwilling to sacrifice that principle for what he called the dubious practical gains promised by preference supporters. Mosque's vision did not prevail. Um, the United States Supreme Court uh, reversed uh, the California Supreme Court's decision in Baki. Um, 
in a, a fractured decision, as described by, by Professor Massey, uh, which was later, um, in a, a sense, reaffirmed, uh, this time by a majority, but a nevertheless fractured decision um, in Grutter versus Bollinger, uh, which occurred 25 years later. Despite Mosk's warning, race-based admissions policies mushroomed on, on college campuses, and a thriving diversity bureaucracy was established to administer them. Now, if Mosk was right, the mistake is going to be very difficult to correct at this late date. It isn't just the iron rule of bureaucracy um, that's at work today, that first and foremost, bureaucracies work to preserve themselves. Many distinguished citizens, university presidents, philanthropists, judges, legislators, they've built their reputation on their support for race-based admissions. Their jobs are not at stake, but their sense of accomplishment might be. Uh, overcoming that won't be easy. But if anything, anything can cause supporters of race-based admissions policies to stop and reconsider, it is the work of Dr. Richard Sander, his careful study of the effects of race-based policies on the legal profession. If his findings are correct, there are approximately 7.9% fewer, not more, fewer practicing attorneys, minority practicing attorneys, as a result of race-based admissions policies. It is unlikely that any but the most evidence-resistant devotee of these policies uh, would want to support them if their effects are precisely the opposite of what was intended. Indeed, if the consequences of race-based admissions policies turn out simply to be a wash, neither increasing nor decreasing the number of minority attorneys, it's doubtful that their current supporters would remain so. Now, Sander attempts to gauge the consequences of what, what he calls, and others have called before him, academic mismatch. He finds that, that what many of us who are familiar with admissions policies in law schools already know, when the very elite law schools lower their academic standards in order to admit a more racially diverse class, schools one or two, two academic tiers down feel they have to do likewise, since the minority students that might otherwise have attended their school are now at the more elite school. The problem is thus passed down to the fourth and fifth tiers, which respond similarly. As a result, there's now a serious gap in academic credentials uh, between minority and non-minority law schools at all levels. Up and down the pecking order, the average, and I mean just the average, there are always exceptions, the average black student has an academic index that is more than two standard deviations below that of his average white classmate. Only historically minority law schools appear to have escaped the full effect of this cascade. Not surprisingly, such a gap leads to problems. Students who attend schools where their academic credentials are substantially below that of their fellow students tend to perform poorly. Um, there are, of course, again, exceptions. But the reason for this is very simple. While some students will outperform their en entering credentials, just as some students will underperform theirs, most students are going to perform generally in the range that their academic credentials predict. No serious supporter of race-based admissions policies denies this. For example, William G. Bowen and Derek Bach, the authors of Shape of the River, Long-Term Consequences of Considering Race in College and University Admissions, and leading advocates of racially preferential policies, candidly admit that the problem is serious in the undergraduate context. That's what they were writing about. I'm quoting them here. College grades for affirmative action beneficiaries present a sobering picture. Um, they wrote, the grades earned by African-American students at the schools that we studied, they studied, um, often reflect their struggles to succeed academically in highly competitive academic settings. Only 45% of African-American students who enter law school pass the bar on their first attempt, um, as opposed to over 78% of whites. Even after multiple attempts, only 57% of Afri African Americans succeed. The gap was thus never closed. Something is clearly wrong here. Uh, when African American and white students with, this, with similar academic credentials, when they compete against each other at the same law school, 
surprise, they earn about the same grades, just as you would expect. Um, and when African American and white students with the same grades from the same tier take the bar examination, they pass at the same rates. Yet African American students as a whole had dramatically lower bar passage rates than white students with similar credentials. What explains this? Well, I'll tell you. As Sander points out, the most plausible answer to that question is that they're not attending the same law schools. The white and Asian American students were likely to be attending the schools a little bit more slowly, spends a little bit more time on matters that are covered on the bar exam, and they were learning while their minority peers were struggling at more elite law schools. Uh, it is this phenomenon that has been dubbed mismatch. Sander calculates that if law schools were to use colorblind admissions policies, fewer African-American law students would be admitted to law schools. That's true. But since those who were admitted would be attending schools where they have substantially the same likelihood of doing well as other students, fewer would fail or drop out, and in the end, more would pass the bar on their first try, more overall than are currently passing the bar. Um, Sanders' findings are stunning to anyone who has supported race-based admissions policies. Uh, but this is just one study. This is just one. There are others that are consistent with it outside the law school context, context but only, only this study has been done in the law school context. Um, Sander himself is happy to concede that his work can be improved upon by further research, and that is precisely why the, U the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, which I sit on, um, has recommended that more research be funded and undertaken. The stakes are very high. If Stan Sander is right, or even partly right, it may fairly be said that almost 40 years of race-based admissions at law schools have been for nothing, or indeed worse than nothing. As Justice Ma Mosk warned, the principle of non-discrimination will have been sacrificed for a sake of a dubious expediency, a practical gain that never materialized. Indeed, just the opposite will have happened. Fewer African-American attorneys will have been produced than would have been under colorblind admissions policies. Uh, alas, such ironies are not uncommon when principles are betrayed in that way. Now, some people look at, at Sanders' study and they say, well, you know, this is enough. We should absolutely go cold turkey. Others will hear none of that, don't believe the study. But let me just give you a, 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 another approach here, um, something that, that, that perhaps steers down the middle. Um, the Civil Rights Commission has made what I consider a very modest uh, proposal, and that is simply that law students be given the information that they need in order to make a judgment for themselves. Uh, these days, when you enter law school, you don't know how likely it is that someone with your academic credentials, and here I'm not speaking just about minority students, but any student, how likely is such a person to graduate and pass the bar? It's something you'd want to know before you take out a loan for $150,000, I would think. Is there another law school that would give a person with your academic credentials a better shot at passing the bar? That's what we've proposed. And I think that some students, minority and otherwise, when they see those numbers, might choose not to accept a preference, whether it's an affirmative action preference um, or an athletic preference um, or a legacy preference, um, a modest proposal. In order to make it work, of course, one more thing has to happen. You might wonder, why do so many law schools engage in these preferences? Not entirely because every law school wants to do so. Accrediting agencies require it. The ABA is the accrediting agency for law schools. You can't sit for the bar in the Commonwealth of Virginia unless the ABA has approved your law school. And you can't get a student loan unless the ABA has approved your law school. Well, the ABA has very strict rules, uh, essentially requiring uh, that preferences be given, and some law schools uh, have attempted to resist this. You can ask me questions about that because I'm afraid I'm running out of my 10 minutes, aren't I? Um, 
so those are the, that's the two-prong approach suggested by, by the, the, the Civil Rights Commission. One, to simply sunshine, let people know what the likelihood that someone of their entering credentials will pass the bar at that law school. And second, allow law schools um, the ability um, to judge for themselves how much, if any, preference they want to give on the basis of diversity. And I'll let it go at that so we can get to questions later. Mine is a much more personal approach to it, and I'm not going to talk about law. And I'm even going to talk about law schools. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the college, and I'm going to talk a little bit about personal experiences. I want to share with you first an anecdote. My son graduated from a superb Jesuit high school in Rochester, New York. One day he came home from school and he was a bit agitated. Daddy said, every time one of my friends learns that somebody didn't get into Harvard, they argued it's because a black student took his place. I turned to him and I said, isn't it sad that Harvard is now a black university? After he finished laughing at my response, I explained that many factors determine the makeup of freshman class. Harvard could fill its roles with talented students who only came from the Northeast, or, or primarily even from New York, where my son was in school. But they want to be a national school, not a regional one. They really are interested in admitting that rural kid from a small town in Idaho, no matter what his race is. So there is this idea of geographic diversity, for instance. I want to share with you another such story. A few years ago, I found myself in a very odd conversation at Parents Weekend. The parents were white and from Georgia, and they were very proud graduates of Duke University. They lamented the fact that their son had chosen W&L over Duke, and they confessed that they were anxious about whether he would be admitted. And the reason, they said, is because they had absolutely no connections at Washington and Lee. They explained that they were well-connected members, uh, that they were well-connected to members of the Board of Trustees at Duke University and could have pulled strings for his admission, but they didn't know anybody here. And they were so surprised that he had gotten in. I listened politely, and most of my students, like Dmitry Slavin or Rebecca Clinton, know that I can be diplomatic. And I decided, in spite of the temptation, not to ask them what they thought about affirmative action. <laughs> now, let me, I took some notes as I was listening to other things. This is the celebration of diversity week at the law school. Gee, I'd never heard of that. Uh, is this the first time? We kind of do things slowly at Washington and Lee, and we do things slowly. We do things slowly in Virginia. Let me tell you, I was 10 years old when Brown v. Board was passed. I graduated from an all-black Jim Crow high school seven years later, and schools wouldn't desegregate here for another five years, and so things don't happen very quickly or very easily with regard to race in Virginia, are at Washington and Lee. Washington and Lee would admit its first black student after desegregation in 1966. And there were only a handful of black students at Washington and Lee when I was an undergraduate in the 1980s. And I did this after working 20 years here and was a member of another minority at WNL, which was more important to me at the time, there were three of us old guys who were married and had children who were strangely in that student body on the other side of the ravine. So we were non-traditional students, something that WNL doesn't usually have. 
The year I took my degree here, Washington and Lee decided to co-educate. That was 1985. But only in the way WNL really does things. The alumni were ballistic because Washington and Lee was going to co-educate, even though it's the best thing that ever happened to this college. And so the alumni concocted a ratio that probably none of you have ever heard of, that for the next 10 years, Washington and Lee would have at least 60% male students. Now, mind you, there was only a handful of black students, fewer than 30 black students on campus at the time. Ten years later, the trustees revisited the issue of coeducation, and I saw a very disappointed President John Elrod in faculty meeting who didn't really want to tell us the outcome of this because he had hoped that the ratio would be dropped. Professor Lewis Hodges, who was also very anxious for this ratio to be dropped, figured out the math real quickly and said, gee, it seems to me that we now are going to be 55% male, and we were. Only two years ago did the student body become 51% female on the other side of the ravine. And the thing that I tell my students oftentimes is that they didn't doctor the balance of gender at Washington and Lee. If we truly had open admissions here, it would be 65% female. It would easily be 65% female. It's not. Okay, another thing. I come back to WNL, where I've spent most of my life in 1995. About two years after I got back here, the Board of Trustees decided, and these are conservative alumni. You don't think about liberals when you think about Washington Lee's Board of Trustees. But the WNL Board of Trustees, who are conservative businessmen, start worrying about whether WNL students are going to be able to compete in a diverse marketplace if they don't have the experience of going to school in a diverse climate. And so the Board of Trustees, in their wisdom, establishes a committee to work on a more inclusive Washington and Lee. And for very obvious reasons, I found myself on that committee. Now, this is late 1990s. And what we ended up doing in late 1990s is not accomplishing very much at all. And then we had three ugly incidents to occur in one school year, in the year of 2000. And I'll name those real quickly, because I don't want to dwell on these things. We had a Jewish student to go by a fraternity house in the company of an Italian-American. They walk in the fraternity, and a, a very boorish senior says, we don't allow Jews, niggers, or fags in this house. This freshman went back to the dean of students, and there were measures taken. The second one is the students elected an openly gay president of the student body. Imagine that at WNL. Then there were students who decided to do impol impolite things to him. Washington Lee noted for its mock convention C-SPAN oftentimes comes to film the mock convention, as they did that year, the year 2000. And the Idaho delegation showed up in a very, very shocking T-shirt, where the image on the T-shirt was a black hooker with a very short dress, exaggerated uh, female features, exaggerated racial features, and above the image, Idaho. Uh, faculty had had just about enough, 
and established a task force to deal with tolerance in our community. The task force was able to do more than the trustees commission. And so we have moved toward a more diverse Washington and Lee, but we've had a very, very difficult time doing it. Now, if we look at the makeup of the student body, there are lots of factors. And by the way, Washington and Lee Board of Trustees filed an amicus brief in the, in the Gratz case reaffirming the Bakke decision. Now, only the trustees have the power to do that. Because liberals on the faculty, of course, would love to do that, but uh, they don't have that power. So one of the things that we have been struggling at at Washington and Lee is making some sense of this. Now, Washington and Lee used to be Division 1A lacrosse. I was very, very proud of that status. If you were a lacrosse player and you were good, and we still, by the way, have a love affair with lacrosse, even though it's Division Three. If you were a lacrosse player, the admissions people were going to be flexible enough that you're going to be at Washington and Lee. And we certainly have advice about that. And we have good retention of both black and white students, by the way. But I was, as I was listening to my co-panelist a few minutes ago, I was scratching my head thinking about one phenomenon that some of my undergraduate colleagues have probably experienced, perhaps Professor Melina Bell, who's sitting directly in my uh, range of vision, or Professor Strong. And I don't begrudge these students because I love all my students. But I see an increasing number of students who come to me with documents from the dean's office telling me that I have to give them extra time for test taking because they have learning disabilities. And you want to know one of the interesting things about it? I've never seen a black student come in with that kind of documentation. And so then I stop and I wonder, well, what happens to the black student who has a learning disability? Are they admitted to the elite institution? Probably not. We want, when we look at prospective students, we want students who bring gifts to the school to make it richer. We want students who have leadership abilities. We want students who are going to make this a campus that is attractive to a wide range of students. The admissions office takes all of those factors into, into consideration. And sometimes with diversity, we do learn and we do benefit greatly. I had one student whose name I will use, who was in the class of 2003, who I learned probably more from than he could possibly have learned from me. His name was Will Kaufman. Some of the alumni sitting around will know who I'm talking about. Will took a ride that he shouldn't have taken when he was coming home from school one day in Lexington, Kentucky. He was a sophomore. He was a soccer player. There was an automobile accident. He was thrown clear of the car, and Will was left paralyzed from his waist down. He came to us in a wheelchair. He fell in love with this place. Can imagine Washington and Lee for somebody who can't walk. Will never saw the inside of my office. I was his advisor for four years. He was one of the most well-adjusted, one of the most popular students on campus. I learned so much about what it's like to be physically challenged from Will, as did all of the students who got to know him. And he was one of the most popular kids on the campus. His mother, by the way, is a federal district judge. So what am I saying? Affirmative action, as far as I'm concerned, it's not an ideal solution, but it at least gives us something, some direction, some way to go, some
some way to figure out how we can give what we are so proud of at Washington and Lee to a good segment of our society and not just to the elite. We have superb retention of both black and white students. And there's a factor that colleges do not measure beyond SAT scores and GPAs in high school, and that's maturity. I find that I have extremely bright students, oftentimes who are men, who are too lazy or too distracted by fraternities or women or whatever, that they're not ready to do the work. They certainly have the ability, and as far as I'm concerned, they are taking a seat that could have gone to someone else. When I look at my grade book, I see that I have as many black students who do as well as my white students. I also have as many white students who do as poorly as the black students in my class who do poorly. I don't see a lot of differences. So one of the things that I think that we need given our history, my God, and we have a horrible history. When I came here to work at age 19, this place was segregated. And I worked here a good while before we saw black people in lots of positions. I am the only black tenured faculty member on the undergraduate side of the campus. I, you know, I have to back up. The only African American tenured faculty member. There's an African tenured member of the faculty. We have struggled like crazy to attract minority faculty. And it's really hard to do. We try to cast wide nets to attract people. We try to do what we call affirmative recruiting. That doesn't always work. And there are a lot of people who don't even believe in affirmative recruiting. But one of the things that if you don't want to see preference, at least you need to make sure that your pool of applicants, whether they're for faculty positions or student positions, includes lots of people with minority background. And I don't think that there is a good effort on the part of a lot of us to do that. So I like Sandra Day O'Connor think that, no, it's not a great solution, but for now, it's the best we've got. And my son, who's a graduate of Lewis Law School, he would prefer to see it based on economics. And so that everybody who was poor had a better chance at college admission. And so we differ on that, and we talked about it. He was very dubious about me doing this, by the way. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I sort of passionately told you where I am on this, and to sort of not try to use legal arguments or statistics to back up what I said, because all of this is here. And admissions officers and faculty members try to be fair, but we want to make human decisions. And we don't want to teach people who are only rich people. We don't want to teach people who are only one race. We want to be able to teach people who look like the United States.
fact that the um, big winners in racial discrimination was eliminated in the University of California system at the, at the top schools were you know, not whites, but, but Asian Americans, uh, is not on its face a cost um, I think what that shows is that Asians were being discriminated against uh, at those schools. And I think that getting rid of that discrimination uh, and uh, you know, as evidenced by the fact that the uh, admit rate of, of Asian Americans went, went up substantially is, is, is not a cost, it's a, it's a benefit. Uh, it's true that at uh, some schools uh, in the University of California system, the percentage of African Americans and Latinos admitted has gone down. Um, I'm not going to say that that is not, um, uh, you know, that there's no cost to that. Uh, but let me uh, caution that that doesn't mean that the number, that, you know, that those black students were not getting in anywhere, or even that they weren't getting into the University of California system. They were. Uh, the University of California system as a whole, and by the way, the University of California system, for those of you who aren't from, from California, um, that is the elite part of the system. It's, it's, it's not, not all public schools in, in, in California are part of the University of California system, only the, the top eight schools, I think, are. And at the, um, um, you know, what you had was African Americans and Latinos who ended up going, you know, not to Berkeley or UCLA, but to other schools uh, in the, in the University of California system, and uh, guess what? They were more likely to graduate then than had they gone to the top schools. This is actually something I know quite a bit about because I am a Californian and I, I was part of a Pop 209 campaign. It is true that the number of, 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 of black and um, Hispanic students went down um, at Berkeley and at UCLA. Uh, the number of black and, and Hispanic students went up at Riverside and Santa Cruz. So you've actually got much more diversity uh, at other parts of the University of California system. And bear in mind that the entire University of California system is the elite system uh, in California. It has uh, now it has nine campuses. At the time, it had eight campuses. Uh, but what happened was UCLA uh, and Berkeley got fewer black and Hispanic students. At Irvine and UCSD, it was basically a wash. Some groups went up, other groups went down, but there were still you know, among underrepresented minorities, it's basically a wash. And at Riverside and Santa Cruz, schools that have not been as diverse as Berkeley and UCLA, they become much, much more diverse. But what's especially interesting is what happened, and I have a specific, particularly from UCSD, which is the third most uh, prestigious uh, school within the, the, the eight school uh, system. At UCSD, uh, at San Diego, at UCSD, prior to Prop 209, uh, there were not very many African American students, um, but they all grouped towards the very bottom of the class. There hadn't been an honor student who was African American um, at UCSD in quite some time. Uh, but right after Prop 209 passes, suddenly UCSD had somewhat fewer African American students. Not a lot fewer, but some fewer. Uh, but they were honor students. There were just as many as a percentage of honor students among the African Americans as there were among whites and Asians. Um, and there were many fewer failures. Uh, to me, that's a bargain. To have students that don't flunk out, uh, that's a tremendous bargain. Sure, there were few, fewer students at Berkeley than there otherwise would have been, a few un underrepresented minority students. But they were just one tier down or so and doing well. What, that's what? another thing. Yeah, and one figure I remember um, uh, with, with respect to Berkeley was that the percentage of African Americans who were admitted to Berkeley uh, and then flunked out uh, was 42% versus 16% for whites. So again, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, unfortunate that not as many African Americans uh, were, were being admitted, but um, on the other hand, you're not really doing anybody a favor by, you know, uh, admitting them and then flunking them out the next year. And note that this is an illusion to say that there aren't enough African American students who can do well in college generally. What happens is, I cascade. At the very, very top schools, there probably are not enough African American students at this time to make those schools feel like they have the number that they want. Uh, but if they were to refrain from engaging their preferences, those students would be just one tier down, two tiers down, and they'd be doing
history as well as students generally. Um, there are plenty of black students, plenty of Hispanic students who can do well at the University of San Diego, at Washington and Lee, um, at most law schools. Of course, they're just not there. Sense. They're at schools where they're not doing as well. Of course, economics is a factor there too, because if you're going to a lower tier school, you're probably less likely to get a scholarship if you need one. And so a lot of a lot of African American students, as they select the colleges that they go to, select their colleges based upon the kind of financial aid they're going to get. One of the things that's happened to historically black colleges, which is one of the reasons that they oftentimes have so much problem competing for really good students, that they don't have the money to get the good scholarships. And so the the thing is, is that there's a formula that sort of goes on with regard to shopping for schools. There is a false assumption, however, that all African American students are on scholarships. And, uh, but there are a lot of African American families who are helping their children to decide which college they go to based upon how lucrative the scholarship is. And that is an important deciding factor for people who are poor. Let me uh, yeah, add, add, add on to that. that uh, you know, frequently you, 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 know, you hear the argument that, well, you know, we, we, uh, uh, one good thing about uh, the affirmative action programs is that they help uh, you know, disadvantaged students you know, who would not otherwise you know, get into school again. Um, but you know, again, it's like the, the Bowen and Bach book uh, that Professor Harriet did. Pro, uh, you know, racial preference. Eighty-six uh, percent of the African Americans who are admitted to the you know, selected colleges that they were looking at comes from middle-class or upper-class backgrounds. Or to put it the other way, you know, only fourteen percent of the African Americans who got into those selected schools uh, were coming from from poor backgrounds. So, to uh, you know, the, this the suggestion. That oh well we're doing this to help uh, you know these these African American kids who grew up in disadvantaged circumstances is simply not true. In fact, no, that's not the way these programs work. Well, I mean, I was going to add that you know with UCLA and Berkeley, there's an article in the New York Times last year suggesting since there is such atrocious number of American, few African American at these, you know what deprived. What the student body is deprived of, although you know, I agree with you know, maybe U UCSD and maybe Riverside and Irvine are receiving more African American students. However, UCLA and Berkeley themselves, the student body, like Professor Delaney suggested, miss out. And some of these students will go on to do important things in society and become leaders, and they miss out on one of the most important aspects in college of diversity, having people of different and now, and now the recruiting effort, what they're doing instead is allowing community colleges to transfer in that are you know, Latino and African American, and these students are doing very well. So you know, my concern is that while Prop 2 and I take away a program, in a say, and I think in a way maybe that's also taking away the normative argument in that if we, if we, why aren't those students who did very well in community colleges and now are transferring in and doing very well in UCLA and Berkeley, why weren't the students recruited in the first place? And you know, I'm afraid because we no longer have this program, we no longer make, making the normative arguments that we need to make when we're recruiting, and that gets lost too, along with just the program itself. I must say, I, I was interested in Professor Delaney's point that the trustees here were actually concerned about whether that you know, students coming to a homogeneous kind of student body were really ready for the marketplace. In, the, in her opinion, in, in uh, Grutter, uh, Justice O'Connor noted that numerous studies showed that student body diversity promotes learning outcomes, better prepares students for an increasingly diverse workforce in society, and better prepares them as professionals. That was from a brief from the American Educational Research Association. These benefits are not theoretical but real, as major American businesses have made clear that the skills needed in today's increasingly 
global marketplace can only be developed through exposure to widely diverse peoples, cultures, ideas, and viewpoints. That came from a brief for 3M and for General Motors. I mean, these, you know, <laughs> those are not your classic, th that's not the ACLU. Yeah, what is more, retired. high ranking, <laughs> if I could continue a minute, retired officers and civilian leaders of the United States military assert that based on their decades of experience, a highly qualified, racially diverse officer corps is essential to the military's ability to fulfill its principal mission to provide national security. And, and she, that goes on a little bit uh, with, um, with respect to ROTC and, and how there need to be officers of all races and, in order to lead uh, the military as well, which uh, has, of course, numerous members from minority groups in it. Um, so I think, you know, part, part of what this opinion is based on is that, in fact, diversity works. Uh, I can tell you one year when we vastly outspent what we really had to spend on scholarship, uh, professional learning, we're talking about, on, uh, we actually had 20 African Americans in an entering class, one male in the president. It was the most exciting, fun, interesting, educational constitutional law class I have ever had the privilege to be part of. It was wonderful because just as the case suggests, I mean, people were not afraid to speak out, they were not afraid to speak their minds, they did, uh, and they did have different viewpoints. And I think that the students who were in that class, besides the minority students, you know, had a really exciting, uh, valuable educational experience that unfortunately, most of my constitutional law students don't have. You think white students and Asian students all think the same way? Well, we have a, lot, a number of Asian, yeah. yeah. You think they all think the same way? No, oh no, <laughs> no I like to think that they agree with me. Uh, would they agree with me about no, this? Because my, I think the people in that class would have agreed with me about this. Yeah, well, my, 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 no, well, my, I said no. Well, right, so I mean, that's my point. Is, but I think that they often attribute to other groups stereotypical, oh, they all think the same way. Well, and they don't have the to opportunity to be disproven because they don't ever meet and get to know uh, people from that group that they can see. Well, you know, maybe a good way to accomplish that that would not involve racial discrimination would be to assign students to read opinions by Justice Bridget Marshall and just and opinions by well, Justice they certainly do Thomas. that.
some students have gotten where they have gotten uh, despite the fact that they have faced a lot of, of uh, you know, social hurdles. Um, if we're going to take that argument seriously, uh, then we shouldn't be using race as a proxy for social hurdle. Uh, we, we should be looking at whether somebody is poor, if that's what we're trying to do, is, is, is to help poor people. Um, I think that, and you know, President Obama agrees uh, with, with me on that. I mean, he, he, he agreed that his own daughters, for instance, should not be given a preference on account of, on account of their race because they came from such a rich background. I think that the, the reason why we still see these disparities uh, on the basis of race um, uh, is, is because of culture, not because of, of, of money per se. Uh, I, I think that, for instance, a lot of, of immigrant groups, both you know, Latino uh, and Asian, may come in uh, lower on the socioeconomic scale, but they have you know, tremendous work ethics, uh, strong uh, two-parent families, and their children you know, grow up versus students who come in uh, uh, from uh, you know, backgrounds where you know, studying hard and working hard is viewed as, you know, quote, acting white, and where students, uh, where, where kids are often you know, brought up in uh, homes without a father. Seven out of 10 African Americans now uh, are born out of wedlock. Um, that is the principal hurdle facing the African American community today, not racial Discrimination still exists. You know, I'm not denying that. Um, but the, the principal hurdle, I think, that, that, that faces them is illegitimacy, not, not racial discrimination. Illegitimacy is also a problem among whites. My argument with regard to economics would be uh, one thing that we notice also at Fremantle is that until the Johnson Scholarship, we didn't get middle class white kids because there wasn't enough scholarship money. Uh, we didn't have diversity of ideas among white students because most white students could not afford to come here. And, uh, and I get really bristled when I hear references to black uh, uh, illegitimacy because most blacks that I know come from two-parent households, and I think that that is just a horrible thing to say. But, and I, and I think you ought not to say it in public. Which may it's be one seven out of ten, system. professor. It's seven out of ten. You yeah, know, but, most of them that you but, know but, may, but, may, may but be. But proportionately, how does that compare to the white population? White is about twenty-five percent, twenty-six percent. It's very high now, uh, much higher than it was. But well, it's I think that still, that's a factor know. that we probably ought not to talk about. Why? It. Because I think that it tends to stereotype people and it projects this image that black families don't exist. And you're never going to solve the problem. You can't sweep it under the rug. something you know valuable about uh, having a mix of students that uh, included a lot of students who came from uh, single parent you know families uh, again if you if you uh, thought that, that was important again you should not use race as a proxy uh, you should not assume that all black children grow up uh, in, in single family in, in, in single parent families because as professor Fine says that is not true uh, if you want to give a preference on the basis of, of growing up in a home without a father, fine. Give a preference on the basis of growing up in a home without a father. This is a significant social problem, uh, and I think that it should be addressed. But you know, to say that, oh well, you know, we're going to fix this problem or we're going to mitigate this problem uh, by giving you know students a preference, uh, you know, 18 years after they're born, uh, in, 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 in where they go to school is, is crazy. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, had a comment, yeah. I had a comment though, on, on this, and that is um, that your notion that because there are differences in academic credentials that exist today, they must be related to discrimination in the past. The truth is there are no two ethnic groups in the country, you know, even within whites, who have the same level of academic credentials. I have you know, some 
data on religious groups, uh, and they vary fantastically uh, in terms of how well they do academically uh, according to religion. Unitarians kill on the SAT. Mm -hmm. um, Jews kill on the SAT. Not quite as good as the Unitarians, but pretty close. Asians do very well, some of that's not a religious group, that's, that's, that's a, 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 a racial group, but I bring it up just to point out that Asian Jews don't do very well. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Baptists don't do very well. Presbyterians do okay, Sisters do a little bit better than that, but you know, there's, there's a range based on religion. And that's not, that's not really discrimination. That, I think, is a cultural difference. Yes? Um, is, is it really fair to
say, well, it's unfair to do that because it gives you political incorrectness on this. 